Well, good morning to all of you, and a Merry Christmas once again. So this week was a struggle as I was putting this message together. I wasn't sure which Hallmark Christmas movie to base it on, whether The Mistletoe Connection or Christmas in the Pines. Uh, They both have such deep spiritual lessons. Thanks, Bob, for making that the focus of my message last week. And so, <laughs> so last week we looked at Jesus asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? And we did a walk through early church history through the first four ecumenical councils, those in Nicaea and Constantinople and Ephesus and Chalcedon, and to see where our theology was born, obviously born out of the scriptures, but it took these godly men many decades to work through the scriptures and to address various heresies that were popping up in the early church to establish for us the solid Christology that Jesus is truly God. He is truly and fully human. He's only one person, and he has two distinct natures, the human and the divine, that are not blended, they're not mixed, but they are distinct. And all of those components of our theology matter. They all make a difference because this is the Jesus that is represented to us in Scripture, and that's the only one that matters. In that passage, Matthew chapter 16 Jesus began with asking the question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What's the word on the street? Who do people think I am? And here's what his disciples answered. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. We're going to hear that over and over today, one of the prophets. There's a a sermon by Charles Spurgeon entitled, Jesus Known by Personal Revelation, and it's based on this passage here in Matthew 16. Regarding the answers from the community, Spurgeon says these three things. One, that they contradict the one and only truth. They're not the truth. Secondly, they contradict each other. It's always interesting when we look at the wrong answers from the world, their wrong answers aren't in unison. He points out that if Jesus is John the Baptist, then he's not Elijah. If he's Elijah, then he is not Jeremiah. And so there's not a consensus. There's still a lot of confusion. And his third point, I think, is our most important, quote, whether the conclusions of flesh and blood are respectful to Jesus or not, they are, every one of them, wrong. And yeah, I use the W word, which is unacceptable in our culture today, by the way, to declare that something is wrong, because our culture, as of today, believes that everyone has a truth my truth, it's your truth, no one's truth can be wrong, and how dare you declare you to be right and me to be wrong? Well, we can declare to do that because the scripture gives us an absolute revelation of truth, and it's not my truth and yours, it is the truth, and if scripture declares it, then that settles it, folks, and it is okay to say that someone's answer, though it was respectful, yet it was wrong. Let's look at these wrong answers for a moment from Matthew 16. Some thought that Jesus was John the Baptist and vice versa. John the Baptist is technically the last Old Testament prophet. You read about him in your New Testament, but he's the final prophet declaring that Messiah is coming, and he gets the special privilege of saying, and there he is. And Jesus is literally right there coming over the hillside He had a ministry of teaching and preaching. He talked about repentance. He talked about the kingdom. He talked about sin. He was baptizing people. And it would be very easy for someone from a distance to look at the ministry of John the Baptist and look at the ministry of Jesus and maybe wonder if they're one and the same. 
In regard to the Elijah possibility, well, that comes straight out of Malachi chapter 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. There is a prophecy given by Malachi that Elijah, or one like Elijah, as is later interpreted, would come. And as Jesus is on the scene, some are wondering, maybe this is Elijah, the one who has come. Now, there isn't a specific Old Testament prophecy that Jeremiah would come, but there was a Jewish tradition, though, that at the time of the Messiah, Jeremiah could make a reappearance, and some threw out that name as a possibility. And for some of these folks, they're just grasping at straws. They're just throwing out ideas, which leads to the ultimate final answer. Some say he's just quote, one of the prophets. That's the easy answer. That's the one that says, I really have no idea who Jesus is, but I want to say something respectful. I think he's probably one of the prophets. And that's supposed to satisfy the questioner that I have a respectful attitude and a posture towards Jesus. And we're going to find that that particular answer is still in use to this day. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? What if this question were asked of our culture today? I don't believe that anyone today would say John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah. That would make no sense for young people on the streets today to think those thoughts. What do people think? I'm going to share with you a short video from a group called Christ Life that went out on the streets. This comes from March of 2017. And they simply asked of a number of participants, who is Jesus? Take a look at their answers. Historical figure? I don't know. I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person like us. He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was a marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't, I don't think he's the son of God. I don't believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed. Like, I'm not going to say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad, and so was, you know... We're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like religiously and morally. He was somebody that um, just tried to Um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I I think that's just a lot of love and and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. Pretty sure he existed. That's a start. A real historical figure. That's true. He was selfless. Yeah. He he came to bring a message and impart wisdom. All of these are, are parts of the big picture, but it's not enough. There were a couple of answers that started to go off in a right direction. One young lady declared that he's my Lord and Savior, but then went on to say, but to me, she being the source of truth, he's the symbol of ultimate love and ultimate forgiveness. Jesus just isn't a symbol of love and forgiveness. There's so much more to whom he is. The young man at the very end is the only one that acknowledged that Jesus is God, 
but it doesn't seem that he fully gets Jesus and that he considered him to be an ominous figure that was hard to relate to. The father would be considered hard to relate to, which is why Jesus came to make the father known. There are a number of these on-the-street interviews that you can find on YouTube. Here are some other answers from other videos. One lady said that Jesus is a myth created by man in order to control society. One lady said, he's one of the spiritual leaders I learn from. I like this one. He's a person who had some messages for people and gave people hope and faith. But what kind of faith? She goes on, he made them believe in themselves and each other. That would be the Disney version of Jesus. I think he was a real person. I'm not sure about the Messiah part, but I think at least he was a prophet. Oh, now we're back to Matthew 16. Jesus was a good man. I'm not sure if he was God or not. And the last one, a character in a story who represents something really good. I don't doubt that Jesus was actually a person, but whether he was a Messiah or a son of God or anything, I don't necessarily believe that. Are you seeing some common threads in these answers? Most people are acknowledging that there was a real historical Jesus. There's only a few that deny that. They, they would have a hard time denying his existence considering his name is so influential. Many of them attribute him humanity. They have no problem with Jesus being human, but being human just like you and I and being nothing more, certainly not the Son of God, certainly not God Almighty. He's mostly respected in these answers. They, they recognize that he was a teacher and that he did selfless and loving things. And like the answer from Matthew 16, one of the prophets. Well, here's another question. What if this particular question were asked of the church today? We, we looked at what does the world think? What do people say about the Son of Man? Well, what does the church think? And in a moment, I'm going to show you a couple of slides from a survey. It's called the State of Theology. Uh, I would highly encourage you to look it up, thestateoftheology.com. It's a, a partnership between Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway Research. They started in 2020, and every two years they put out this research project where they ask over 3,000 participants a series of about 30, 35 questions. These questions are actually posed as statements, and the respondents have five answers. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, not sure, somewhat disagree, and strongly disagree. And these theological statements are made, and everybody has one of those five buttons to click on. I was hoping that this survey would reveal to us that the world has Jesus wrong and the church has him right. I was hoping. Take a look at statement number six. Here's the statement, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Those of you who were here last week learned that in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, we addressed the Arian heresy, Jesus is not a created being. In the general population of 3,011 participants, 55 of them, 55% of them agreed with the statement that Jesus is the first and greatest created being. Well, on the survey, you have the opportunity to click on and off all sorts of different data points, whether you want answers from just male or female or different ages and ethnicities and whatnot. Well, there's also a spot where you can choose to only get the answers from those who claim to be evangelical, those who would say, I am a gospel-believing Christian. 
And out of the evangelicals, 73% of them agreed with this statement. Seven out of ten among the church that answered this survey would say that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. You know, when I first went into last week's message, I asked myself, is this too elementary of a lesson? I mean, am I, am I stepping back too far to ask the question, who is Jesus at Christmas time? Is everybody going to throw tomatoes and think, come on, we all know all of this? And yet I look at statistics like this and these survey results, and I'm absolutely shocked and horrified. Seven out of ten in this survey had it wrong. Are they honestly evangelicals? If they've got the wrong Jesus, do they have the right gospel? Statement seven reads this, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And again, a little over 50% of the world altogether, all respondents said, yes, I agree with that. He was a great teacher, but not God. That's expected. And in fact, I thought that number might even be higher based on the YouTube videos I watched that everybody wants to acknowledge his humanity, very few his deity. And yet when I put on the filter of evangelical, there were still 43% that agreed with that. How can four out of ten people in American churches say that Jesus is a great teacher, but he's not God? What is being taught from the pulpit to these people? Well, probably movies like The Mistletoe Connection and Christmas in the Pines. And they're not studying the Word of God and the full counsel of God, and it doesn't matter to them. Folks, theology matters. The Word of God matters. We can't just say, oh, it's Christmas. It's all about Jesus. We have statements like, Jesus is the reason for the season. True. But which Jesus are you talking about? Because if somebody among these survey participants was going to declare Jesus, they've got it wrong. And folks, we can't afford to get it wrong because eternity depends upon getting Jesus right. These are some scary numbers, folks. And, and it's one thing to say, yeah, boy, those other people, they've got it wrong. What if, what if Northern Heights took the State of Theology survey? And there is an opportunity for you to go online and do just that. Would we be shocked at the results as well? Would we be horrified at the doctrine that is not known and agreed upon in this congregation? And I know that's kind of a heavy statement to make, but folks, I want us to be thinking because there's a lot of people, according to this survey, that are not thinking, and they've got it absolutely wrong. So let's ask this, what is it that's so wrong about declaring Jesus a great teacher or one of the prophets? I mean, isn't it true that he is a great teacher? He's called rabbi, which is a teacher in Israel. And that's what he spent about three years doing, walking around up and down all throughout Israel, working with a certain group of students, we call them disciples, and he was teaching them all about the kingdom. Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus declared powerfully what God has said. Jesus declared powerfully what was yet to come. It is true that he's a great teacher. It is true that he's a prophet. So why are these answers wrong? Because they fall short of giving you the whole truth. Listen to what Spurgeon says in that same sermon. Today they rend the seamless vesture of the crucified. They retain his example and profess to value it, but his sacrifice they fling aside as a rag of superstition. They dare to deny his miracles while they applaud his precepts. They will have nothing to do with the doctrine of the cross, but with the self-denial of the cross, they affect to be enamored. Our Lord will not thus be divided. Those who take not a whole Christ, take not Christ at all. 
You hear what he's saying there? The world likes aspects of Jesus. And unfortunately, the church likes certain aspects of Jesus. I don't know that he did miracles, but I like the principles that he taught. I don't really want to get close to the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of sin at the cross, but I like the self-sacrifice of the cross. I like a man who makes a sacrifice and thinks about others. Spurgeon says, and rightly so, that Jesus cannot be divided. He's not like a, a whopper at Burger King that you can have your own way and Yeah, I really like the cheese, but hold the mayo. It's unacceptable. Jesus is presented to us as a whole in Scripture. In the church, often we want to subdivide out the Jesus as Savior and the Jesus who is Lord. It's very popular for people to be enamored by the Savior Jesus To simply go into a room and say, who would like a free ticket to heaven? Jesus the Savior is offering them today. Boy, and all sorts of hands go up. To ask in that same room, who is ready to repent of their sin and turn to a life of holiness and bow the knee before Lord Jesus and commit to obeying what is declared in his holy word? And then you hear crickets in the room. Boy, I don't know that I want to do that. I just want the Jesus that keeps me from going to hell, but not the Jesus I have to follow. And he will not thus be divided. Folks, he's not just a great teacher. He is almighty God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 9. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. That's Romans 9.5. Christ, who is God over all, similar to what's said in Titus 2, that we are waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're waiting for, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus. Jesus Christ. There are those that will declare, oh, the Bible never says that Jesus is God. Jesus never claimed to be God. Folks, I could give you the whole message on just verses in which Jesus himself and all the other biblical authors declare Jesus absolutely to be Almighty God. If Jesus is God, then I actually have to listen to him. I have to surrender to him. What he says matters. If Jesus is just a great teacher from the past who taught loving principles and gave up his life as a sacrifice, there's lots of people in world history and in American history that we can say that of. And we could admire them, but we don't have to be accountable to them. He's not one of the prophets, folks. He's the great I am spoken of by the prophets. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is being called of God to go speak to the people and bring them a new message. These people that have been in Egypt in slavery. Moses says, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. It's kind of a weird name, isn't it? It's a little different sounding. It's a state of being. It's not so much a name. God is telling Moses, I am the eternally present God who is right now. Uh, God is never the I was. We've had plenty of I was experiences where, where you look back and like, man, back in the 80s, I was something in school. The 80s were weird, folks. Um, <clears throat> I look back at old pictures of what I used to wear in the 80s and I think, 
why? Why in the world would I have done that? But we look back at the I was, and sometimes like that was our glory moment. But those days are gone. Your body is not the same as it used to be, and your mind isn't the same, and everything's changed, and boy, I was somebody. Some people are looking ahead of the I will be or I want to be, and boy, one day when I accomplish this, one day when I cross that benchmark, then I'll be something. And our lives are often defined by the I was or the I will be, and God doesn't think that way. He is eternally in the now, and he is the great I am. God doesn't look back, and I used to be a great God, and now look at me. I'm all falling to pieces. One day I hope to be this. No, the the God that exists now is the exact same God that has always existed. He existed eternally before earth was created. In my mind, I always just wonder, like, what did he do? Because I try to put boredom upon God. What do you do for all eternity before you create planet Earth and you have a bunch of disobedient people to manage? But I don't know what he did in all of eternity. But God has always existed, and that's how he declares himself to Moses. What does that have to do with Jesus? Oh, Jesus makes it about him in John chapter 8. The Jews are challenging Jesus in that chapter on all sorts of points. And... Jesus says to them, well, your father Abraham, he rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. You can imagine how confused the Jews would be at that statement. They said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, and notice he doesn't give a grammatical correct grammatically correct answer regarding being old or he would have said I have been but he says before Abraham was I am he knew exactly what he was doing there and the Jews knew exactly what he was saying as well and it made them mad that this man would declare to be the great I am folks he's not just a good man He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. There's a long passage in Revelation 19. I'll, I'll get towards the end of it here. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Listen to this line, folks. No one answered this in the YouTube videos. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Remember, the God of the Old Testament is the mean God of wrath, and the Jesus of the New Testament is the nice guy, right? That's another way that we divide God, and we cannot do that. This is Jesus that we're seeing, that will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He doesn't leave room for us to say he was a good man. He was a good teacher. Folks, he's not just a symbol of love. He's the very essence of of love. Scripture declares of God that he is love. Not that he is loving, but he actually is love. What is love? It's the character and nature of God. We use him as our means of defining love. And he demonstrates that love by taking the wrath of his own father upon himself. Romans 5, God demonstrates this love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Such an important evangelistic passage that you can share with folks that don't believe that they are worthy, and you can agree with them, you're right, you are not worthy. Oh, but I I need to clean up my act before I can come to Jesus. Because all of us say, man, I better get cleaned up before I take a shower. 
It makes no sense. No, you don't clean up to come to Jesus. You come to him with all of your sin and all of your shame. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say when you make all these changes in your life. When you are acceptable, then I will go to the cross on your behalf. On the cross, he was asking the Lord to forgive us as we are crucifying him. Folks, that's radical. He's not a symbol of love. He's so much more. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 3 about the love of Christ in his sacrifice on the cross. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Folks, there's enough material in that paragraph for you know, a month of sermons. But let's look at a few highlights. Right in the middle of that text, it says that Jesus was put forth by God as a propitiation by his blood. It's a fancy Bible word. It's not a word that you use in conversation today. This has to do with the payment that is made. The payment is being made by the Son and to the Father because it is the Father whom we have offended. It's the Father's wrath that we need to be concerned about. Jesus doesn't save us from Satan. Jesus doesn't pay the price to Satan. Satan has nothing to do with our salvation. The Father has been offended by our sin and in His holiness demands payment. And if you and I were to try to make that payment... It would cost everything that we have, including our eternal lives. Folks, you can't afford to make that payment. Which is how the passage began, telling us that the righteousness of God is now revealed apart from the law. You cannot keep the law to make yourself righteous enough to make payment. But Jesus can. Jesus was put forth as a propitiation That word in the Greek is the same word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, when it refers to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. That lid is known as the mercy seat. Those of you who have seen the original Indiana Jones film, um, there is a depiction of the Ark of the Covenant in that film that's actually a pretty decent representation now, the rest of the film is not so much a biblical representation, but, uh, but that box, though, that gold box that's carried by the poles and it has a lid with the cherubim's wings over the top, that's what the scriptures describe the Ark of the Covenant to be. That lid is that place of atonement. The high priest would go in past the outer courts and past the holy place and into the Holy of Holies, and he could only do that once a year. And he would bring in a blood sacrifice with him, and he would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. Propitiation was being made so that the sins of the people would be covered for that year. But like a flu shot, it doesn't just keep going and going, and you got to go back to Walgreens every year and get a new one. The the high priest would have to go in and make atonement again, year after year, which is why the book of Hebrews declares Jesus to be so much greater because his sacrifice was made once and for all, and it didn't have to be repeated. His blood is so much greater than the blood of the bulls and goats that had been used. Isaiah 52 and 53 have so much to say about this. We'll look at just one line here. 
at the end of verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned aside every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Couple that with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Folks, you want the gospel in a nutshell? That passage does a fantastic job. The perfect Jesus, Jesus the God-man, who knew no sin, he had no sin of his own, he became sin so that you could become righteousness. It's not your righteousness, and it's not his sin, but he was willing to trade with you. Back to the passage in Romans, it concluded with the line that God might be both just and the justifier. How is that possible? Because if if he is a just judge and we have violated his law, then justice demands that we pay for it. The crime must be paid for. Well, couldn't God just say, forget about it? Well, some of us in parenting or in positions of authority, we do say, forget about it, and we violate justice when we do so. God's not going to violate justice. I saw a video exposing a lot of modern heresies, and, and one modern heretic says that God is willing to break the law for love. In the same way that a parent would break a speeding law to take a sick child to the hospital. It is true that you and I might break the law for love. It is not true that God would do that. If God violates his own law, folks, everything falls apart. Because he's no longer just and faithful and true. His integrity is gone and everything is gone. How is it that he is then both just and the justifier? Well, our sin is deserving of death. We are told that in Genesis, that in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We're told that in Romans, that the wages of sin is death. And God came up with a very clever plan, that someone will die for your sin, it just doesn't have to be you. And if Jesus dies bearing your sin, he who knew no sin becomes sin, well, then it's as if you didn't commit any sin. And then you can become the righteousness of God, the Scripture says. Folks, that's the amazing miracle of the gospel message. And that's what we need to be proclaiming this Christmas season. I've got one final point to turn the message in a different direction. Of all the answers we've heard from the videos, from the book of Matthew, they're mostly very respectful of Jesus. They've got him wrong, but they at least respected him. But that's not always the case. There are those that also blaspheme the name of Jesus. Happened in the New Testament. John chapter 10, the Jews said, He has a demon. And is insane. Why listen to him? They said in Matthew 11, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard. And in many times and places, in Scripture, in church history, and in our day and age, the name of Jesus is misused. It's abused. It's used as a curse word many times. You know, in our household... We obviously every household has different standards for movies and what you consider to be acceptable and unacceptable, and some of you have filtering systems to weed out some of that. And I recognize that there's going to be some movies we watch where every now and again some foul language might come up, and and every family's got to have their standard set of what am I willing to listen to and what am I willing to watch. But I can tell you that for my wife and I, when we hear the name of Jesus being blasphemed over and over in a show or in a movie, 
it's time to stop that one and find something better because it just gets old. It just gets so hard to hear. You'll notice that no other God is cursed. You don't hit your thumb with a hammer, Krishna, and, and, and curse another God. Only Jesus is cursed in that way. My wife was in Bath and Body Works a number of years ago shopping for something and this young lady and her child came in and she was smelling all the different fragrances and sharing them with her kid and every fragrance that she didn't like or it was too strong, she would curse the name of Jesus in the way that she referred to that. And over and over and over again until my wife could stand it no longer and rebuked the lady for blaspheming her Lord. The lady, continuing to be very crass, spits out the answer, well, he's my bleeping Lord, too. My goodness, folks. His name is blasphemed. But you know what's interesting? As I was putting this message together and thinking of how evil and awful that is to use his name in that way, is it really any different than the person who says, I think Jesus was a great teacher, but he's not God? They've got the wrong Jesus too. And even though they have a respectful attitude toward him, they are respectfully wrong. And, and to be wrong and nice and to be wrong and evil, they're both wrong. And they both need to hear the gospel. They both need the true Jesus why is it that Jesus' name is both so offensive and so abused in these ways? And I'll tell you, because his is the only name that matters. Think about Philippians 2. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Couple that with Acts chapter 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected for you. By you, excuse me, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only name that carries with it any true power and authority. It also carries with it conviction. Boy, it's easy for a group of people in the business place to refer to God, especially with a lowercase g, just covers all of them. Politicians will say, oh, in this time of distress, let's call upon all of our gods of various faiths, and you go to your God, and I'll go to my God, and there's no definition, and so there's no conviction, there's no accountability, but boy, you walk into that room and say, we're going to talk about the Jesus who's going to tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, whoa, you just got way too specific, because now you're talking about a Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And there is no other right answer. Folks, that's, that's time to be canceled. That's unacceptable. We can't declare someone to be wrong. I isn't it acceptable that I have my truth and you have your truth? No. What's acceptable is that I need to line up with what is truth. And you need to as well. And if you don't, then you are wrong. Not according to me, but according to the word of God. And why does that matter? Because it has eternal consequences. And folks, the world is lost. And unfortunately, based on those survey results from the state of theology, much of the church population is lost. If Jesus is a created being and he is not almighty God then they've got the wrong Jesus in their gospel message. They've got the wrong gospel. And folks, there's more people lost than we thought there were. What do we do with all of this? Let's wrap up with a few points of application. 
Number one, I want you to be a diligent student who can give a biblical answer regarding the question, who is Jesus? Second Timothy 2, it's our standard Awana verse, do your best, be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling or rightly dividing the word of truth. And folks, that's what we're doing here even this morning, and hopefully you did in class today as well. So that if someone were to come to you, and you happen to be featured in a YouTube video, and someone came up to you on the streets and put a microphone in your face, to you, who do you think Jesus is? You're like, oh, wow, I've been waiting for this moment. And you had an opportunity to declare the truth according to the Word of God. Be ready to give an answer, Scripture tells us. And you can't be ready to give an answer if you've got the wrong answer. Number two, what can you do? Honor the name of Jesus by showing him reverence, showing him respect, showing him fear. That could be its own sermon to talk about the fear of the Lord. We don't have time this morning. But folks, the name of Jesus is precious. It's worthy of worship. It needs to be guarded. It should not be used lightly. Only use it when you are actually intending to use it to lift him up. Not as a cuss word, not as an exclamation. Number three, teach your children, teach your grandchildren, teach your neighbor's children. Find someone that's younger than you and teach them who Jesus is. And and I want to share this with you. My wife was teaching Sunday school in the first uh, sermon time this morning, and she wanted me to know what it is that they're teaching the kids, and I want you to know as well, because this should give you some hope and some comfort for our congregation. Their lesson is about Jesus before the manger, the eternal Jesus, the Jesus that has always existed. Listen to what they've been studying. Jesus is eternal. He always was and always will be. He was present at creation and appeared to people throughout the Old Testament. But he left heaven and was born as a baby to fulfill God's promise to send a Savior. Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross to save us from our sins. He conquered death and returned to heaven where he is preparing a place for God's children. Folks, you need to appreciate what our children's ministry is doing and making sure that we have biblical material for our kids. So those kids are actually getting the lesson that Jesus is the eternal son of God. He's not a created being. Those kids could probably answer that survey better than many adults could. The fourth point of application, and I'm going to say this in every message in this whole Christmas series, the best Christmas gift that you can give Jesus is to share the message of Jesus, to present the gospel, and Christmas makes it so easy. There are depictions of Jesus all over in the commercial district in so many ways. Even at your bank, there's probably a nativity scene set up. And what an opportunity for you to talk to people about the gospel. Don't waste the Advent season and not share the gospel. We don't simply want people to look at the, the symbol of Jesus like in the manger before us here in front of the pulpit, but we want to make sure that we tell people who he really is. And so look for opportunities to share the gospel this Christmas because people really do need to know who he is because they've got it wrong. And getting the wrong Jesus is going to give us the wrong gospel, which has grave consequences. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that in declaring yourself, you left no room for question or doubt. We know who you are, Lord. We don't have to guess. We don't have to go on a feeling. We don't have to share an opinion. Lord, your word declares to us with great detail, who it is that you are. And Lord, we confess that that we've gotten it wrong in church history, in our culture, even in our own lives, Lord. There's times that we've been wrong. 
Lord, thank you that your word corrects us and gives us what is truth. And we ask now, Lord, that as we go forth from this place, that we would have opportunity to share this truth with our neighbor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.